Well, good morning. Um, we're going to begin this study with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we invite your presence again as we open your word, as we look at statements in the spirit of prophecy regarding uh, the events that are coming upon this world. We pray that you can help us in developing a Christ-like character, that we can live through this time glorifying you. Be with each person, watch over them. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so you can see the title here. This is from the, the book booklet, The Crisis Ahead. This is chapter number nine, Satan's Personation of Christ. Now, this is the particular uh, chapter uh, that made it probably, well, there's two two different things that made a strong impression on me back in the early 80s when we studied this, or mid-80s. And that was um, regarding the condition of the church at the time that the Sunday law occurs and and how the work would be accomplished, not by man's machinery, but by the unction of the Holy Spirit, that uh, God would guide and organize his work in a way that it was evident that he took the work into his own hands. And then this here, dealing with Satan's personation of Christ, which I find that Maybe some people could say it's just sort of an intellectual idea and it's maybe a moot point. It's not that important. Um, understanding that Satan's personation of Christ occurs after the close of probation. Now, Olson's going to take the position that it occurs prior to the close of probation. So he takes a different view, but he does mention the other view. And um, so we, we've spent time looking at uh, the fact that Satan, of course, uses miracles. There's true miracles. There's false miracles. And in the last days, Satan has this power uh, to do miracles of sort, uh, to deceive those that are following him, right, to give evidence. We know that there's going to be a counterfeit Christ, an antichrist. And within the Christian world, there's all kinds of different ideas. Generally, I would think evangelicals look at it as some kind of sec secular antichrist, some kind of, you know, businessman or something. Uh, um, some, some have it as a religious antichrist. They might see, you know, the Pope as the antichrist. Um, but uh, as Seventh-day Adventists, we under that, understand that Satan's going to personate Christ. Now, what's the difference between personate and impersonate? Anybody know? Well, I thought it meant the same thing. Yeah, it doesn't. Oh, well, that's new. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So they are close in meaning, right? So personation rather than impersonation is prime is primarily is a primarily legal term. Now, this is a modern. This is Wikipedia definition, uh, meaning to assume the identity of another person with intent to deceive. It is often used for a kind of voter fraud where the individual votes in an election whilst pretending to be a different elector. Now, as far as um, when we look at uh, Webster's, the 1828 dictionary. So these are words that, of course, the words change meaning over time. Let me look this up here. I remember looking this up, well, probably about uh, yeah. nearly 40 years ago. So last time I looked it up. Yeah, I had to stop the share for some reason. That was uh, okay. Uh, to counterfeit, to feign as a personated devotion, to resemble, uh, to make a representation as a picture, to describe, to celebrate. So I guess the difference between personate and impersonate. You know, impersonate in Webster's, it says to personify, which I'm not really sure what that means. So they're, they're, they are making them somewhat similar. But can you impersonate somebody without an intent to deceive? Well, you know, if, if it's at a party, say, and you're kind of making fun of somebody, you imitate his or her gestures and statements and facial expressions and so forth. I mean, the folks there will know who you're trying to impersonate. Right. So, so, so generally, in, yeah, so impersonate can just mean... Uh, to give an impression, you're impersonating somebody, but nobody's going to necessarily think that you're you're trying to deceive them. But personate has with it the intent to deceive, right? Does that make um, sense? 
I, I, I really thank the other nighters. I thought, okay, that was the 1840 version of impersonate. And all these yeah. years I've thought, Satan will impersonate Christ. Well, I can, I mean, I've seen demons, so I know they, they impersonate people. So yeah. that, that really didn't phase me much. So I never bothered seeing whether there was a difference between impersonate and impersonate. Yeah. Yeah. So this, so Satan will come as Christ, you know, claiming that he is Christ. So, I mean, we could, I guess, call that impersonation, but impersonation doesn't always imply deceit. Impersonation does. Um, and that's that's the term that's used. So anyway, I, I wanted to just clear that up because I know it's been a long time since I looked at it. So we got Satan's personation of Christ. What is Satan's masterpiece of deception? Who does he make himself out to be? The conflict is to wax fiercer and fiercer. Satan will take the field and personate Christ. He will misrepresent, misapply, and pervert everything he possibly can to deceive, if possible, the very elect. Uh, a power from beneath is working to bring about the last great scenes in the drama. Satan coming as Christ and working um, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. And what's going on here? There we go. Um, in those that who are binding themselves together in secret societies. So one thing is we can see that there is a work that Satan's doing now, right? That is a work of deception. But the personation of Christ is a separate work. If men are so easily misled now, how will they stand when Satan shall personate Christ and work miracles? Who will be unmoved by his misrepresentations then? professing to be Christ when it is only Satan, assuming the person of Christ and apparently working the works of Christ. What will hold God's people from giving their allegiance to false Christs? Go not after them. How close is Satan's resemblance to Christ? It was by the display of supernatural power and making the serpent it, um, his medium uh, that Satan caused the fall of Adam and Eve in Eden. Before the close of time, he will work still greater wonders. So far as his power extends, he will perform actual miracles. But there is a limit beyond which Satan cannot go. And here he calls, and here he calls deception to his aid and counterfeits the work which he has not power actually to perform. In the last days, he will appear in such manner as to make men believe him to be Christ come the second time into the world. And he will indeed transform himself into an angel of light. But while he will bear the appearance of Christ in every particular, so far as mere appearance goes, it will deceive none but those who, like Pharaoh, are seeking to resist the truth. So that means the righteous are not going to be deceived by this, right? Satan will work with all deceivableness of a righteousness to, to personate Jesus Christ. If it were possible, he would deceive the very elect. Is it possible to deceive the very elect? No. No, right. Now, if the counterfeit... No, bear, that's those, the, uh, no, and that, that, no, and that is one of the most oft-misquoted scriptures that I've come across. That and the love of money is the root of all evil. Those two. Because it's not the love. It's... Yeah, or sorry. Yeah, money is, is the root of all evil. Yeah, and it's the love of money that is. And uh, if it were possible, and people forget that two-letter word, if it were possible, yeah. and it's not, the elect will not be. Yeah. Now, if the account of it bears so close a resemblance to the genuine, genuine, is it not essential to be on our guard that no man deceive you? Satan is not permitted to counterfeit the manner of Christ's advent. Right? What will Satan do and say, and how will the people respond? As the crowning act of the great in the great drama of reception, Satan, reception, deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. The church has long professed to look for the Savior's advent as the consummation of her hopes. Now, the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come. In different parts of the earth, Satan will manifest himself among men as a majestic being of dazzling brightness resembling the description of the Son of God given by John in the Revelation. Revelation 1, verse 13 to 15. The glory that surrounds him is unsurpassed by anything that mortal eyes have yet beheld. 
The shout of triumph rings out upon the air. Christ has come. Christ has come. The people prostrate themselves in adoration before him while he lifts up his hands and pronounces a blessing upon them as Christ blessed his disciples when he was upon the earth. His voice is soft and subdued, yet full of melody. In gentle, compassionate tones, he presents some of the same gracious heavenly truths which the Savior uttered. He heals the diseases of the people, and then in his assumed character of Christ, he claims to have changed the Sabbath to Sunday and commands all to hallow the day which he has blessed. He declares that those who persist in keeping holy the seventh day are blaspheming his name by refusing to listen to his angels sent to them with light and truth. This is a strong, almost overmastering delusion, like the Samaritans who were deceived by Simon Magus. The multitudes, from the least to the greatest, give heed to these sorceries, saying, this is the great power of God. Now, um, this is taken from the Great Controversy, page 624 and 625. And this is in the chapter called uh, chapter 39 called the time of trouble. So this is describing events after the close of probation. Now, Kelly, of course, you remember Bev Familler. Now she, she would take this and she picked up on the word now. And she tried to say that this, yeah, now the great deceiver will make it appear that Christ has come in different, right? And she tries to she tried to move that to before the close of probation, but in the context grammatically, it's talking about then, right in the future. The now then is is in the future, right? Now she see she connects that now with an earlier, so it's um, in page six twenty three or six six twenty four at the beginning. Now, while our great high priest is making atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ. So she connects that now. <coughs> she says that there's a time shift and that, that this is then <coughs> moving Satan's personation of Christ into the, the time when Christ is uh, making atonement for us in the most holy place. Right. Does that make sense? How, how she does it. So this was my, my friend, bad family. But but I disagreed with her, and um, and and she was one who would take the the statement, you know, to deceive if possible the very elect, and would say, well, that if they're going to be deceived, it must be for, before the close of probation, because after the close of probation, you know, the righteous have been declared righteous and the wicked have been declared wicked. So we're going to look at this a little bit more in some of these other statements. At the second appearing of our Lord Jesus. As the second appearing, second appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ draws near, satanic agencies are moved from beneath. Satan will not only appear as a human being, but he will personate Jesus Christ. And the world that has rejected the king, or rejected the truth, pardon me, will receive him as the Lord of lords and king of kings. Will he even be accepted by heads of government? Disguised as an angel of light, he will walk the earth as a wonder worker. In beautiful language, he will present lofty sentiments. Good words will be spoken by him and good deeds performed. Christ will be personified, but on one point, there will be a marked distinction. Satan will turn the people from the law of God. Notwithstanding this, so well will he counterfeit righteousness that if it were possible, he would deceive the very elect. Crowned heads, presidents, rulers in high places will bow to his false theories. And what shall we do when we are commanded to worship him? Satan came as an angel of light in the wilderness of temptation to deceive Christ. And he does not come to man in a hideous form, as he is sometimes represented, but as an angel of light. And he will come personating Jesus Christ, working mighty miracles. And men will fall down and worship him as Jesus Christ. We shall be commanded to worship this being whom the world will glorify as Christ. What shall we do? Tell them that Christ um, has warned us against such a foe who is man's worst enemy, yet who claims to be God. And that when Christ shall make his appearance, it will be with power and great glory, accompanied by 10,000 times 10,000 angels and thousands of thousands. And that he, when he shall come, 
that when he shall come, we shall know his voice. To what pinnacle will the apostate churches eventually exalt Satan? In this age, Antichrist will appear as the true Christ. And then the law of God will be fully made void in the nations of our world. Rebellion against God's holy law will be fully ripe. But the true leader of all this rebellion is Satan, clothed, clothed as an angel of light. Men will be deceived and will exalt him to the place of God and deify him. But omnipotence will interpose, and to the apostate churches that unite in the exaltation of Satan, the sentence will go forth. Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine, and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord who judgeth him. Okay, now uh, we have talked before how within the church itself that we're much like the world. And and I was watching a video, which which I want to discuss this point a little bit. Uh, this was a video put out by a sociologist, sociology professor, some guy. And uh, I guess he, he was doing a study showing that atheists are more moral than theists. And Kelly, you've probably run into this kind of thoughts from uh, your son there. In that uh, atheists are more tolerant have more compassion and empathy and have higher ethical standards uh, than theists. This was his claim. Well, that, that also comes from just a misunderstanding of, of the Bible, uh, of the character of God yeah, and, yes. and the lie of the lie of an eternal hell. And so, yeah, yeah, but yeah, yeah. That's a philosophical idea that's uh, among this generation. Well, well, one is it just, and it has to do also with the standard of righteousness that they decide to just to define morality. So, so he defines morality as compassion, empathy, and ethics. I'm not really sure, you know, what you mean by somebody's more ethical. So, with a humanist. Uh, you know, a humanist morality, if you're going to te- uh, judge morality based upon a humanistic morality, what's the problem? What's the problem with that? Are the Ten Commandments the standard then that he's de- deciding who's moral? No. Yeah, right. So, so we can easily set up a standard. I mean, uh, of morality. People do it all the time. They set up their own standard of morality. And then if, if your standard of morality is yourself, are you going to be able to meet up to it? Of course. <laughs> right. So I, I thought it was kind of silly, really, you know, the way that he defined what moral was. So if you if you believe that homosexuality is a sin, well, you're you're intolerant. Right. So obviously you're, you're way less moral than an atheist who accepts homosexuality, right? So when we look at this idea of the world, of how they decide what is righteous, I mean, Satan personating Christ, he's going to be very accepting and loving and compassionate and tolerant and inclusive, right? He, he, yeah, his, he sound he, like old friend. Yeah, he, he's going to be flattering to those that are worshiping him. So he will meet up to that standard of righteousness that that is a, you know, it's, it's a standard of the world, right? I mean, the world does have a standard of righteousness, but it's something that they can perform. Like, to be compassionate. What does it mean to be compassionate? I mean, how do you measure compassion? You can't, but uh, I mean, I feel compassion. Well, you know, I so do, it, okay, go I do feel you. compassion for those who, who, who suffer. But unfortunately, as in my own life, a lot of the sufferings are brought on by our sins. Yeah, well, so the thing is, a person can... There's a different... Yeah, okay, Kelly. For, for, yeah, for, first, the difference between compassion and empathy. So, with compassion, we can have compassion for others and it doesn't drain our energy. 
Having yeah. empathy drains our energy because we take their feelings upon ourselves to, to yes. be empathetic. And I've done that, and yeah. I have to guard against it all the time. Yeah. Well, and this, this, and that's where the difference. Just, just let me finish. Uh, that's where the yeah. difference is with compassion and empathy. So, em empathy, we have no boundaries. We just, we just become like the second person to them, taking on all their sorrows and pain and in a sense crisis like that but i don't know even so compassion has has what we call uh boundaries we we can have compassion for another person to a point only where we don't have the capacity ourselves to to help or like it it becomes an unhealthy thing Empathy can become unhealthy where it's taking our own life. Now, in the Christian model, I don't know, some thoughts on that, Theodore. And and then, then you were talking about, uh, what was it? Oh, comparing our, so the scripture that I just posted there in the chat, that that's, that's the one that came to mind when you were talking about uh, making ourselves a standard, if you want to read that one for us. Yeah, okay, so... Yeah, um, 2 Corinthians 10, 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Yeah, so, yeah, so it, it's kind of, well, foolishness. So this guy, Professor Phil Zuckerman, he says he explores why non-religious individuals often exhibit more compassion, empathy, and ethical behavior than their religious counterparts. Using research and data, he challenges the myth that morality requires belief in God and highlights how secular val values can lead to a more just and humane world. Right. So, so he's written a number of books, including Society Without God, Beyond Doubt, what it means to be moral and living the secular life. Now, I did have um, uh, my first marriage, my wife's uncle, who was raised in a Japanese prison camp in Indonesia. He was also a high school teacher, and he wrote a book on uh, atheistic morality. Uh, to, it was about a book on how to teach atheistic morality to high school students. And uh, he came as a patient to Silver Hills and, uh, when, when I lived there. Uh, when me and, and me and Levine lived there and our kids were little, the oldest, three oldest ones. And uh, um, Phil Brewer, who worked with him one-on-one, uh, -on -one, um, and I can't remember, I know he did, my, my uncle died, my, my wife's uncle died, I don't know, not long after, like maybe 10 years after that. And he wasn't very old, but, you know, he was an atheist. And um, I'm trying to remember all the details about what Phil said in his conversations with him. I had some conversations with him as well. But, you know, the thing that lacked, that lacked his, his ethics, his uh, atheistic ethics, is that there was no basis for love, right? So... When we look at, at the type of morality that secular humanism provides, and, and I know we have all these words and all these definitions like compassion and empathy, what do they actually mean? I mean, obviously, they can mean different things to different people. Words have more than one, meanings, one meaning. But when we think about the end of the world, uh, I mean, we've probably all seen that, that meme on Facebook where – there's a Bible and it's got all this scribbled, all this text scribbled out. But the only thing you can see is judge not, right? Which is how non-Christians read the Bible, right? So the whole idea of ethics is you shouldn't judge other people, that people who judge others are really the, the only bad people, right? So being inclusive and accepting is, in this context, considered moral. So we can see that that idea of morality is not really what the Bible teaches about morality, that it's a counterfeit of love. Because 
if we accept somebody for whatever they claim to be, whatever they're doing, is does that mean we love them? Uh, well, that's that's where the Christian High Wire Act comes in and and love because love is a fine balance. It's a, I don't know. Again, through the Holy Spirit only, we can love the person, but not love their sin. Right. Where in the tolerance of humanism, you know, oh, well, they, they do this sin. We should just accept them. You know, we shouldn't be harsh or critical, you know, that type of idea. And in reality, that is not love. Uh, often we excuse other people's sins because we want to do our own sins. If we were to condemn their sins, that means we would have to condemn ourselves. So right. true. Now, let me say, now, now, let me say, you know, since you use the example of homosexuality, in my business, I worked with Calgary's top interior designers, and many of them were homosexual. I don't know why they're so successful at it, but they were also I only met one, uh, like 99% of them, only one was like an angry, resentful person and mm -hmm. the group of friends he hung out with. And and that was them as persons. But as persons, they are some of the kindest, most generous, loving people that I've, I've met. So, again, I, I did. I worked with them for years and – and some of them I'm friends with to this day, you know, and I would still consider them friends even to this day. And the thing is, is can I, can I be um, accepting of them, but not, they knew where I stood, mm -hmm. but I didn't make a point of it. I, I just loved them. I, I was their friend. So right. yeah, with, can, and and we think of judgment with this word judgment. There's such a misunderstanding. Like we have to use our judgment, discernment, um, but we don't judge in the terms of condemnation with judgment. Uh, that people think mm -hmm. if we're judging, we're condemning someone. No, no, no. We're just using our discernment. Yeah. I mean, you know, I mean, obviously I can use uh, my daughter who is now a man. Obviously, I love her and care for her, but I would never condone her actions. That is, I'm not going to support her in her decision. Now, that would be considered um, not very compassionate. So one of my sons won't talk to me because of my position regarding transgenderism. Now, is he being uh, loving and compassionate and kind in not talking to me because I don't accept my daughter's decision. No, he's not. See the see the guns gun points both ways, right? I mean, I I work yeah. work work with homos and trannies, if you want to use that term. Sometimes they'll accept it, sometimes they won't. Yeah. And I've seen both kind of very very angry, very very vicious toward heteros like me. And I said, look, I said we need to work work together. Let's focus on what we do have in common. I said the worst sin of all is self righteousness. And I yeah. said, you don't believe in my moral standard? I don't accept yours, but we can still be friends. And we did turn out to be friends. Right. But I now, think we knew where each other stood. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and with my daughter, obviously, she knows I still love her and care for her, right? Um, it's more the other people around her who uh, don't want her to listen to me or talk to me uh, because they know that I'm not going to accept her decision. Um, but I'm going to see it as wrong, right? Um, so I would be considered intolerant in this in this world's standard, right? I mean, I'm not going to call her, uh, you know, change her pronoun. I'm not going to call her by the name that she uses. You know, she's still Elizabeth or Beth or Bess or, you know, whatever. I I've called her in the past different names at different times. But I'm not going to call her by some male name that she's chosen. And she accepts that, you know, herself. It's the other people around her who don't accept it. And and definitely, uh, you know, within our society, there's, I mean, they're trying to make it, they try to make it a crime, basically, not to, re, 
not to accept a person's change in pronouns. So that's 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 the thing that shot Jordan Peterson to international attention. Yeah. 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 Can I explain something that's going on between? I'm sorry. Can I explain something that's going on between me and my daughter? Um, I don't know. Do you really want to? Do we need to, to to go through that? Well, I mean, I don't know what it is. So, I, well, this, here's the thing. My good daughter went to Fletcher High School, mm-hmm. and she um, and she came. She when she went there, which is my fault. I should have never sent her to the high to the school to start with. But mm-hmm. when she came out and she graduated. And all that, she, she you knows she got like all most some of us anyway, yet got um on the wild side, in other words. So, so now she's totally coming, totally coming back to Jesus, but mm-hmm. she uh, she uh, told me, she told me that Jesus. That she said in the Bible and that Jesus told her that earrings was all right. And I told her that 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 I don't think Jesus or the Holy Spirit would tell you that earrings was all right to have. Mm-hmm. And that and she's gotten tattoos, you know, and I told her I I kinda got upset about it because I wouldn't want her having tattoos all over, all over her body, but mm-hmm. and I, and she said, "Well, I I didn't see nothing wrong in the Bible where it said." And I said, "Well," and she said, "The Holy Spirit said it." You know, she read the Bible and studied it, and she said that she thought it did. And I told her, I said, "Well, I don't think the Holy Spirit would tell you that it's all right to mark of your body." Okay. Well, so, well, let's just kind of condense this here a little bit. So. So people have behaviors, whether whatever it is, of things that they want. And so in the case of your daughter there, I mean, she wants to wear jewelry. She wants to have tattoos. Right. And we see this within the church. So the standards have changed from the past. Um, I mean, there are things in our baptismal vows that, uh, you know, nobody pays attention to anymore, even though they still have them in the vows. Right. Right. There used to be a more marked distinction between the standards of the church, of Christians in general, and that of the world. You know, there was a time Christians did not, uh, you know, go to the theater or go to, uh, you know, places where people were drinking alcohol and so forth. Right. Um, but that's changed. Right. So Christians do all kinds of things that they never did in the past. Now, when somebody says, well, the Holy Spirit showed them this, obviously, we would be the intolerant ones uh, regarding those types of issues. And obviously, how we deal with these types of issues uh, is sometimes a problem as well. Right. So um, maybe we don't deal with it in the best way possible. But the point here. That we're trying to make. The reason I brought it up is I want to know if it's something that I'm doing that's wrong. Yeah, that's what I'm addressing here. That's what I'm addressing. So what we need to recognize is that we can accept the person, that we can't correct everyone. Now, of course, you know, if it's a 10-year-old daughter, it's a lot different than a a 20-year-old daughter, right? Right. Well, she's 30-something years old, yeah. Uh, But you know what I'm saying. It's just like, you know, somebody who's on their own, like, I'm not going to try to correct my children in everything that they're doing wrong. Because one is I taught them from the beginning. They already know what I think, you know, so me telling them again isn't going to really help them too much. But I'm definitely going to live my life in a way that's consistent with what I believe, because if they see me being consistent, that's that's a stronger testimony than any of my words of, you know, correction. Right. Right. So so I'm not telling you whether what you did is right or wrong, but I'm saying that. It, it, it definitely isn't necessarily going to work, as you found out, right? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But so anyway, all right. I just, yeah. I'm just trying to figure out things. Yeah. 
So, so we know that we need to be able to re reflect Christ's character and how we deal with others. Now, the counterfeit is the world will be accepting of sins as if they are okay, right? So they're going to be way more tolerant than, than a Christian is going to be regarding all kinds of things. So obviously, from their standard, they're more moral, right? But if you look at what love, love is, love sometimes has to give a warning, has to give a rebuke. If, if I'm just accepting of everything my children do and, and never correct them, and, and tell them that it's all good, whatever they choose to do is good. Um, that's not really love. So love is love is love covers a multitude of sins. Love love changes people. Compassion and empathy are not the same as love. And and of course it depends how you define empathy. People can define it lots of different ways. It can just be more a feeling um, about how we we feel with someone. That's generally what it's thought of as. Okay, when does uh, the outpouring of the wrath of God, the seven last plagues, occur in relationship to Satan's personation of Christ? So this is that main point. That's why I kind of wanted to rush through that, because I want to get through this point. Little by little, he has prepared the way for his masterpiece of deception in the development of spiritualism. He has not yet reached the full accomplishment of his designs, but it will be reached in the last remnant of time. Says the prophet, I saw three unclean spirits like frogs. They are the spirits of devils working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Revelation 16, verse 13 and 14. Except those who are kept by the power of God through faith in his word, the whole world will be swept into the ranks of this delusion. The people are fast being lulled to a fatal security uh, to be awakened only by the outpouring of the wrath of God. So we know that this is the sixth plague, right? The three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. And uh, then we have uh, this other statement here from early writings. After putting Jesus in the background, they attract the attention of the world to themselves and to their miracles and lying wonders, which they declare far exceed the works of Christ. Thus the world is taken in the snare and lulled to a feeling of security not to find out their awful deception until the seven last plagues shall be poured out. Uh, but the people of God will not be misled. The teachings of this false Christ are not in accordance with the scriptures. His blessing is pronounced upon the worshipers of the beast and his image and the very class of whom, upon whom the Bible declares that God's unmingled wrath shall be poured out. So he's going to address this uh, a little bit more. Uh, how long will Satan remain on the earth in his Christ-like form? Uh, there's no information on this point. He apparently will not be visible at the time of the seventh plague, or the people would angrily turn against him. But all unite in heaping, uh, all unite in heaping their bitterest condemnation upon ministers. So he's making a, an inference from silence here. Um, doesn't say that that that. He, the, the people are angry at this person who personated Christ, Satan. Okay. And how should we prepare for Satan's deception so that we shall be able to withstand his wonderful miracle working power? Uh, go to God for yourselves. Pray for divine enlightenment that ye may know that you do know what is truth, that when the wonderful miracle working power of Satan shall be displayed, and the enemy shall come as an angel of light. You may distinguish between the genuine work of God and the imitative work of the power of darkness. Many who embraced the third message had not an experience of the two former messages. Satan understood this, and his evil eye was upon them to overthrow them. But the third angel was pointing them to the most holy place, and those who had an experience in the past messages were pointing them the way to the heavenly sanctuary, many saw the perfect chain of truth in the angel's messages and gladly received them in their order and followed Jesus by faith into the heavenly sanctuary. These messages were represented to me as an anchor to the people of God. Those who understand and receive them will be kept from being swept away by the many delusions of Satan. Okay, so, I mean, he, he throws this uh, 
statement in here. There's a lot of context from this statement in early writings. So when is she talking about many who embraced the third message had not an experience in the former former messages? What's the context there? Anybody know? They uh, produced a character, Christ-like character up to that point. Okay. But, but just historically, what's the context where she's talking about this in early writings? A great disappointment or the, after the just after the disappointment. Yeah, so she's talking about the third angel's message that comes after the great disappointment, right? So many who embraced the third message had not an experience in the four, two, two former messages. That is, many people who are accepting the third angel's message that of, of the Sabbath and Christ's work in the sanctuary in heaven, they weren't actually part of the Millerite movement, right? That, that's what she's saying. Um, so then she's saying in this context, Satan was seeking to overthrow them. But the third angel was pointing them to the most holy place. And those who had an experience in the past messages were pointing them the way to the heavenly sanctuary. So there was others, those who went through the first and second angels messages, were combining those messages together. That is, they were helping them understand the third angels message in the context of the context of the first two messages. And so even though they didn't have an experience in the first and second angels' messages, they could see the perfect chain of truth in the angels' messages, right? So this isn't really talking about, you know, after the close of probation or anything. So in the context here, it's a little bit where he puts this in here. It, it, it's a little bit confusing that he uses this. Now, of course, it's not here talking about Satan's personation of Christ or the many delusions of Satan not necessarily dealing with what's going to happen after the close of probation. So I kind of think it was not, not the best statement to put here without more context. It would be misleading. So now he's going to ask this question, which is uh, we're going to probably take a few more minutes than we need to, than, than, than our time that's usually allotted, but we started late. Uh, do all Seventh-day Adventists agree that Satan will personate Christ prior to the close of probation? No, they do not. Many able students of the Bible in the spirit of prophecy locate Satan's personation of Christ at the time of the sixth plague. The two principal LNG White quotations given in support of this are, one that he's already quoted, right? Little by little, he has prepared the way for his masterpiece of deception. And we saw three unclean spirits like frogs. They are the spirits of devils working miracles, right? So Ellen White quotes this verse from uh, Revelation 16, verse 13 and 14 in the context of the masterpiece of deception. And then uh, the next one, fearful sights of a supernatural character will soon be revealed in the heavens in token of the power of miracle working demons. The spirits of devils will go forth to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to fasten them in deception and urge them to unite with Satan in his last struggle against the government of heaven. By these agencies, rulers and subjects alike will alike will be alike deceived. Persons will arise pretending to be Christ himself and claiming the title and worship which belong to the world's redeemer. They will perform wonderful miracles of healing and will profess to have Revelations from heaven contradicting the testimony of the scriptures. As the crowning act in the great drama of deception, Satan himself will personate Christ. So he's going to say, Sister White's use of the phrase the last remnant of time and her use of the six plague language in describing satanic dramatic appearance as Christ are considered to be compelling arguments in favor of locating this deception at the time of the sixth plague. Now, what he has failed to add here is that Ellen White places it during the time of Jacob's trouble, right? So when we look in the great controversy at um, uh, this statement, right, the, dealing with Satan's personation of Christ during the plagues, it's, it's pretty evident that it's in this chapter dealing with the time of Jacob's trouble. So it's the chapter called The Time of Trouble, uh, chapter 39 of Great Controversy. And um, as I pointed out before, Bev Familiar, she tried to take, you know, that, well, now while Christ is our great high priest making atone for us, we should 
making the atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ, doesn't mean that the whole section in Great Controversy moves to 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 that Satan's personation of Christ is going to happen be, while Christ is uh, in the most holy place before he closes his work, right? It, it's it's obvious he's just saying here is now when we need to prepare. Right. We can't wait till after the close of probation to prepare for Satan's personation of Christ. Correct. Yeah, that's right. Oh, yeah. I, I want to say something, too. These are, all, these are all written for our warning, right, to to be prepared. I also yeah. wanted to mention and just fill in some blanks or whatever. Bev Van Mueller. Now, when I came into the church, she was teaching Sabbath school and so on. She was. She was a matriarch in the church, so she was our elder. She was like our, the matriarch. She was the, she was the old lady in the church, and she, she was sixty five. Probably, probably wasn't that old. Yeah, yeah. Well, how old would she, would she have been in the eighties? Like sixty five, and so I was. I, we were in our twenties or whatever. And yeah, so she was. She was. She was a respected, a respected teacher, and, and she was on it. You know, she taught a lot of us and grounded a lot of us in, in the truths of the Bible. So all due respect to her, but, yeah, in that case, she was wrong, definitely. She also told he Heidi that if Theodore ever becomes available, you should marry him. But uh, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you like that? <laughs> Yeah, now, that was before she just. When would that have been? To uh, did 2000, she pass? Two thousand seven. That was two thousand seven. She died in, uh, I think, November of two thousand twelve. Hmm. So. Two thousand seven. You guys hadn't even met yet, had you? Heidi and I, no, we didn't meet till two, till after Bev had passed away. But she told, mentioned you to Heidi. Yeah. Well, that's very interesting. Yeah, I thought so. Um, anyway, I know that's a whole other side. But, you know, we know Bev, um, and uh, she definitely was a pretty special person. Um, but I disagreed with her on this point, right? So she would go to the chapter of the time of trouble. She would say, well, now while our high priest is making atonement for us, we should seek to become perfect in Christ, right? Um, and then she would just say, well, that's the time shift that happens here. It's bringing us back to this time when Satan's personation of Christ is going to occur. But it's pretty clear when you read through this, that this is, is referring to events that are connected to the time of Jacob's trouble, right? So dealing with, uh, I'm not gonna go through and read all of this, um, but people can read it in the great controversy. Um, so, so I disagreed with Bev, and I also disagreed with uh, Robert W. Olson and what he said. So I understand why people take that position. Now, the question that I'm asking here that is why is this important, that we place Satan's personation of Christ after the close of probation during the sixth plague rather than beforehand? I wish Stephen was here. He was here before he disappeared, but because um, him and I have had this discussion before. So why is it important to get this this one point correct? We, we touched a bit on it last time. Or maybe it wasn't last time. Anyway, someplace where we were talking about the statement in uh, uh, Spalding and McGann. Was it last time? I think that was about three weeks ago. Okay, yeah, I'm trying to think. <laughs> okay, so it's in Miscellaneous Collections and Spalding and McGann. It's on page two. So copy of three early visions. Um, so it's this vision, which is um, October 23rd, 1850, right? So this was this paragraph where the Catholics bid the Protestants to go forward and issue a decree that all who will not observe the first day of the week instead of the seventh day shall be slain. And the Catholics whose number are large will stand by the Protestants. The Catholics will give their power to the image of the beast and the Protestants will work as their mother worked before them to destroy the saints. But before their decree bring or bear fruit, uh, the saints will be delivered by the voice of God, right? So this is announcing the day and hour of Christ's coming. Then I saw that Jesus' work in the sanctuary will soon be finished. And after his work, 
there is finished, he will come to the door of the first apartment and confess the sins of Israel upon the head of the scapegoat. Then he will put on the garments of vengeance. Then the plagues will come upon the wicked, and they do not come till Jesus puts on that garment and takes his place upon the great white cloud. Then while the plagues are falling, the scapegoat is being led away. He makes a mighty struggle to escape, but he is held fast by the hand that leads him. If he should effect his escape, Israel would lose their lives. I saw that it would take time to lead away the scapegoat into the land of forgetfulness after the sins were put on his head. So my view and understanding of this. So here she's just giving this really quick representation of a lot of things without a lot of detail, which have been fleshed out later because this is an early vision where she's seeing this. And, and so she's describing this, which is obviously symbolic. You know, Satan isn't going to be a goat. And he's not going to, you know, Jesus isn't going to come and actually, you know, place his hands upon Satan's head, and he's not going to literally lead him away. But we can see that during the plagues, this is when the scapegoat is being led away. That is, we know that Jesus is going to pronounce the righteous is righteous, the wicked is wicked, and the righteous will not turn away from their righteousness and the wicked not turn away from their wickedness. And so to understand Satan's personation of Christ in the context of the great controversy, we need to see that what it is, is that Satan in that time, he is doing everything he can to deceive those who Christ has declared as righteous. And if he could be victorious, he would affect his escape. Right. Does that make sense? I know we, we kind of jammed this all in at the end of the study. But can we see why fact, you said he affected his escape? Yeah, so Satan is seeking his escape by deceiving the elect. If he could deceive any of the elect, his his um accusations of God would be they would have weight, right? So God wouldn't be able to declare who is righteous and who is unrighteous. Right, right. He would win, right? If he can, so the 144,000 who are going to be declared by, as righteous by God, who are not going to see themselves as righteous, who are going to go through the experience of, of Christ upon the cross, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, and yet not turn from their righteousness, the Lord's goat, right? They... They will then uh, vindicate God's character. We dealt with this last night as well. And so we can see why this is important, right? Why this issue, uh, to me, it's important. It, it was something that I understood a long time ago in the context of the great controversy. And, and to me, it was important. But most, it was hard to convince any Adventist that Satan's personation of Christ happens after the close of probation. Everybody wanted to put it before because of the statement to deceive, if possible, the very elect. And they said, well, how can it be after the close of probation if he can deceive the elect? And I says, he doesn't deceive the elect. But anyway, hopefully people see my point. I, I think it's important. I know. Any, any final comments before we close with prayer? Because we went way over time. Well, that, that's actually a little bit of a paradigm shift for me, even. Um, Mm -hmm. uh, well, after the close of probation, the impersonation of Christ happens after the, the close of probation. What, what is the, what is the purpose of him? He is trying to escape. But what is how if, how would he escape if, if, if probation can, has been closed? Because if he can cause any one of the righteous to turn away from their righteousness, then he wins. So his his this is his last desperate act to deceive, if possible, the very elect. He wants to deceive them because if he can, then then he wins. Right? He escapes. He won't have to suffer uh, for being the instigator of sin. His accusations against God would have been correct. So then, yeah. Uh, I'm kind of seeing it like so. Then that's like a final, final test. Yeah, it's um, it's the final. Yeah, well, that's what it is. The the hundred and forty four thousand living through this master working of deception of Satan, 
it, it's going to appear to them as if they are the outcast of, of the earth. To all appearances, they are wrong. Just as Jesus, after 40 days of fasting, Satan comes to him, if thou be the son of God, turn these stones into bread. It appeared to Jesus that he was who Satan was insinuating he was. Satan was insinu insinuating that he was actually the fallen angel, that he was Satan himself, right? Mm -hmm. So so it's the same kind of test. The 144,000 will vindicate God's character. They will demonstrate that God can judge the human heart and can prepare people who can live in the sight of a holy God without a mediator. So it, it's, it has to do with the whole issue of the last generation in context of the great controversy. But yeah, it's not well accepted. It's not well understood. It's something that for Adventists has been really, as you can say, Kelly, you've been Adventist a long time. It's obscured, right? Uh, no, no, let me, let me walk, let me walk through that again. So following the logic, um, Okay, so Jesus, at the close of probation, Jesus declares, those who are righteous shall be righteous still, and mm -hmm. the wicked, what, however he puts it again, yeah, well, the unrighteous wicked. will be unrighteous. Yeah. yeah. Um, still, so at that point, it's declared. Mm -hmm. So, like... What is the purpose of the final test? Uh, because, well, then Satan, declared, it? because if Satan can prove it, that declared is wrong, then then Satan wins. Okay, and and it's really f not for the sake of the redeemed so much of the hundred and forty four thousand. So much is it is it for the watching universe, for the theater of the universe, the unfallen worlds, the holy angels. Is that for their yes. yeah, and also for Satan because Satan, you know, I mean, he's going to have a thousand years to think about it, you know, and then at the end of that thousand years, when uh, during the Great White Throne Judgment, Satan himself will bow and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, right? But yet it will he'll be right. unchanged. And see, you know, none of the right. wicked turn in their wickedness; the plagues fall upon them. But they're still not going to turn to God, and none of the, none of the righteous will will depart from their righteousness, even though they appear to be unrighteous in their own eyes. That so, that, that point of, of the wicked not turning from their wickedness that that one is really nailed home for me. In uh, when when the holy city after a thousand years descends and uh, mm -hmm. on the earth, the new Jerusalem, and mm -hmm. it says that. The wicked surround the camp of the saints, mm -hmm. and and uh, it's like a like a standoff. Everyone's standing still, waiting for the for the command to charge the city and take it by force. Satan convinces yeah. them, um, but up until that point, the, the gate of the city is open. It's when the charge begins, that's when Jesus raises his hand and gives the command to close the gate. So it's kind of like the gate is still open at that point. Come, come and be saved, sort of. It's an open invitation, but they just come in anger. They they come to take it by force. So at that yeah. point, Jesus, that's when the final gate is closed. I, I thought that was pretty significant, actually. Yeah, because none are going to change. I mean, it's it's more symbolic than anything because they've already made the right. decision. The nation has closed. Right. Right. It's, it's, it's the, old, the, it's the last, know, last example of God's enduring love. Yeah, yeah because even, even if he offered it, they don't take it. They they accept their fate instead. Right. So so this is something which I believe is, is really important that Adventism provides is this issue of why sin still exists and how sin will finally be eradicated from the universe. And, and it's, of course, from the Bible, but most people just miss it. Anyway, we need to close with prayer. So thanks, thanks for that. Kelly. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study today. I pray that you can bless each person on the Sabbath and that we can continue to learn and study um, and understand your word.
bring us together again to study tomorrow morning for those that are able and uh, help us in our personal walk with you to reflect your character. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.